this session and uh, we are going to put this on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, Parhas, can you stop sharing so that I can start? All right. So uh, let's. So this is the first monthly update that uh, we've been having, and we've not really had anything before. We did have a small implementer catch up sometime last month where we talked about many of these feature, many of the features that we're going to talk about. And uh, what I was thinking is uh, also go through them really briefly. Uh, we'll say what is what is happening and what we're thinking or or what is going on under the hoods right now, which you'll probably see over the next month or so, and what direction we are going. So that's the broad idea of what we wanted to do in the next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, in terms of new features, there are uh, basically three different things that uh, we are uh, working on right now. There are some UI UX enhancements, which uh, which we covered during the last implementation meet as well. But uh, uh, this was primarily started or initiated by uh, Leadership for Equity and the TJP, which we will talk uh, sometime later in this call. Uh, but that was uh, that was one major piece of what we, we were working on. Working on. There is some uh, significant work that we spent on trying to make the data entry app, which is basically the browser based app, which you can use to enter data uh, to bring some fun functional parity uh, with respect to the Android app. Because most of the work we do is on the Android app and uh, uh, it's mo that's the most highest used app on the field. Uh, and a lot of times those don't get directly ported onto the uh, browser. We've spent some time doing, trying to bring some more parity into it. That This work is ongoing. Some part is already released and some part is still ongoing. Uh, there's also something about user subject types, which some of you might find interesting. Uh, let's go over to what I mean by the UI UX. So this is uh, this is an implementation, and you can, as you can see, if you have, uh, you've seen the search bar earlier at the bottom, right? So now that has been moved to the top, um, and then there's also this option to do a list style card. So earlier we had either tiles or we had. Uh, line type cards, but we didn't have a list. So when you say, when you have a list, like for example, you could, uh, this one is a list where there is data for June, July this year. We can also have mul multiple months on the same uh, kind of card. And you could potentially think of this as uh, like, if you're, uh, if you're dealing with anything else, like so for example, uh, looking at the weight of people, you could have things like uh, below five, below 20 kilograms, 20 to 30 kilograms, and the entire thing in one list. So that's one change that's there. Uh, you can see that there are two dashboards here. So earlier we had only the option to have one dashboard, and now you can actually have two dashboards. Now that the search bar has gone on to the top, you have more space at the bottom to add more dashboards if you want to. Um, in this particular case, uh, implementation, what's happening is in the first tab, uh, people, anything that needs to be known immediately is shown. And the second scorecard is something that's more long-term-ish that people can see whenever they want to. That's how it's done there. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see some the search results that you'd be familiar with, but uh, everything on the right-hand side has moved to the left. So earlier, the location and the programs that somebody is enrolled in would have shown in the right. Now, this was not a very scalable way of uh, working on the mobile app. So we pushed everything down to the left and it will show one after the other. There's also some extra spacing on both these uh, to make it easier on the eyes and so that people don't see just text, text and text everywhere. Um, although right now, even now, you can see that there's quite a lot of text, at least in uh, in the screenshot that I'm see showing. Uh, but it is relatively easier to read compared to what it was before. <clears throat> On the dashboard of a particular subject, whether it be a, a household or a person or whatever, there were two changes. One important change is whenever somebody fills in a piece of data, it is shown on the screen directly. And this is not when you schedule it, but when you actually perform or fill up that form, it gets shown here. So this is uh, this is called a filled 
filled field or the filled value. So that's one thing that has come in. And the other is the ability to edit or the ability to restrict people from editing something that was made uh, earlier. So you could have things like saying, um, <clears throat> I I don't want people to edit some uh, edit a form that was filled in two days, more than two days uh, uh, later. So those are kind of workflows that we can achieve now. There have been a lot of NGOs who have actually asked for this uh, before. And we could not really bring this uh, uh, bring this in at that point of time, but now this has been included in the product. Uh, this is a screen that you can see about the, uh, this is from the data entry app. And uh, what you can see is uh, this is a repeatable question group. So this is something that's been there in the system for a long time, but only in the mobile application. This has now been brought over to the uh, data entry application. So this uh, is one of the things that's happened on the data entry applications. There are other small insignificant changes that I will not be covering as part of this. Uh, the last piece of what the, we've done is the user subject types. So there were, uh, and this has happened before where uh, I think uh, in a few implementations, people wanted to fill in forms for themselves. Like there is a field user and you want them to fill in a monthly report or you want to uh, you want them to be able to do some kind of a feedback or a complaint or anything like that earlier there was there was no direct way to do this what we used to do is we created we create subject types of a specific type and then what used to happen is that if there are two people sharing a same catchment one person's records would go to the other person's phone and uh, this was not really a very scalable way of doing things so right now there is the mechanism to actually fill in user specific form so i can fill in you can do this for feedbacks and complaints now earlier you could not do this because it could get shared across catchments but now you could actually have users fill in forms that are just for themselves and not about a certain beneficiary who's on the field so that is something that is out there that it has gone live right now and it can be used uh, any questions before uh, we move ahead Okay, um, what's coming up next? Uh, Android and the Google Play Store keep giving us trouble. So one of the things that they've said is within the next month, we need to upgrade an Android version. So that's one thing that's absolutely necessary, which we will be doing. There is some unfinished business, as we said on the data entry application. There is some level of functionality that we'll be adding. And uh, there's also some performance tweaks that we'll, uh, we'll be doing on the data entry application. Hopefully these changes... Uh, on actually that both the necessary and the unfinished business changes will uh, uh, will get released by the end of this month. Uh, there are new frontiers, which essentially is uh, around two specific ideas. One is around uh, Google and its Play Store. Uh, we've been having some difficulty with trying to push releases and we cannot do it as fast as we really want because the review times, uh, at least for the past couple of months have become really slow. So we are trying to see if there are workarounds that we can use to make sure that we could do um, over the air updates essentially. So you get an Android uh, <clears throat> app installed, but any uh, any updates can be installed over the air. That's one thing we are uh, spiking on at this point. Uh, the other important thing that we are trying to work on is to try to make the app designer as user friendly as possible. Uh, until now, it's mostly been our implementers using it. So we've given some consideration to make their lives simpler, but we've not really tried to uh, bring the the level of um, sophistication required to be able to design this. This usually happens when you add a new feature. There is something that's crudely done that somebody on the Avni team can do it, but it will take really a lot, lot of effort for somebody who's outside to take care of it. Uh, things include automatic dashboard cards. So dashboard cards used to be uh, one place where people had to always write JavaScript in order to uh, make it happen. Now you could build, uh, at least in the next release, we'll have something where we can build something like this, a dashboard like this without code. So we are trying to make it as no code as possible. Um, the other is uh, trying to work quite a bit on the CSV upload side, trying to make errors a lot more user-friendly. And uh, the 
uh, there's also like uh, we're also trying to add a lot more instructions to uh, to the CSV sample file so that it becomes really easy for people to understand and create the right kind of uh, CSV files to upload. And there's some work going on with the automated automatic self-service reports. So the idea here is once you create an organization, you'll automatically get reports uh, created on Metabase, uh, which is our reporting platform. That's some work that is ongoing right now. I am expecting this to happen over the next two to three months uh, uh, for this to actually go live. But the work is ongoing at this point of time. We're also trying to build some kind of a Metabase training mechanism so that uh, people can uh, actually look at it and try to develop or write reports by themselves instead of being dependent on somebody to take care of it. Because Metabase is a really powerful tool to be uh, writing or to be getting analytics. And it's meant to be a self-service tool for people to start using it. If you have decent knowledge of Metabase and a decent knowledge of our database model, you should be able to do most of the analysis of your data yourselves. That is the purpose of uh, bringing this Metabase training module. This Metabase, general Metabase training available elsewhere, but that doesn't work. That doesn't talk about what your specific data model is in Omni. So that's something that we're trying to do. These are the new things that we're trying to do over the, or, or that we are doing right now, or we're going to do in the next couple of months. At least that is the plan right now. But uh, now that I can actually see quite a lot of uh, uh, people here who are uh, who are in, uh, like uh, uh, using Avni today. Any comments, anything that you think uh, or your wish list that you think Knight needs to be added or any comments on what's put here? All right. So uh, these are two challenges that we are seeing at this point in time. Uh, one is the Play Store host that I talked about, which uh, has been causing quite a lot of release, de release delays. And uh, the other thing is the mandatory upgrade requests we get from implementations. Uh, the other one is not really a challenge, but we really want to try to make uh, like work a lot on the app designing side. So Essentially, the idea is if there is somebody who knows, uh, who can, who has some technical capabilities and by technical capabilities, I mean, somebody who can definitely like work on Excel, write a formula and things like that. Uh, somebody at that level to be able to design an organization for Omni. So that's one of the challenges that we've taken up. Uh, hopefully in the next few months, we should, we want to do quite a bit of work on in this area. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Vinay. So before we start this session, let me introduce our guest speaker for the session. Uh, I'll talk about the I'll talk about the organization he is coming from and uh, a brief intro about Siddhesh. I hope you are able to see my screen. So Leadership for Equity is a leading Indian education nonprofit working in the domain of education uh, policy and the implementation. Uh, LFE basically partners with the uh, local and state government in India uh, to systematically support government institution to deliver the uh, quality education at the scale. Uh, over last seven years of LFE, uh, they have grown to more than 100 people team and currently I think they are impacting more than 3 lakh teachers uh, and the government function. So having a collective program reach of 8.8 .8 million children uh, studying in the government school uh, across 15 states which covers Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Nagaland, Haryana and Tripura uh, with onboarding partners like the World Bank, Bosch, Amazon, Bajaj and etc. Uh, they are receiving global recognition from school Ashoka, Brookings, uh, and etc. So LFE has been able to create meaningful growth on multiple systematic 
uh, indicators like pedagogical uh, skills of teachers and the leadership skills as well. Uh, let me talk about Siddesh. Siddesh is the co-founder uh, and the chief program officer at Leadership for Equity. He has worked with education system in many states across the country. And independent studies showed that their work in Maharashtra, Maharashtra basically uh, had impacted and resulted in uh, more than 10% growth in the literacy and almost 20% in the literacy across all the grades in the government schools. So we at Avni are partnering with uh, Siddesh and LFP from last two years. And many product features in Avni have been built through for the uh, Teach AP, which we have built. Uh, I think it's getting benefited uh, across multiple NGOs uh, because of LFP so far. Uh, Siddesh is a both deep thinker and a doer at the same time. Thanks a lot for agreeing to join uh, this session, Siddesh. Once again, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Any opening remarks, Siddesh, you want to give? Then we can start the session. Yeah. Uh, a, I'm really happy I could be a part of this because uh, I am also able to see the journey and development of the Avni uh, platform over and above whatever the needs and demands of uh, Teach AP. And last two years, I think there has been a lot of discussion among us with just this one use case. And I understand that it's a big, much broader journey in the sector that uh, the Avni platform is taking. And glad to see that, you know, UI UX changes, which also got initiated with our discussion is now taking shape and benefiting all the users across the spectrum. So very happy to be doing that. And it has been a learning journey for us as well. Because coming from primarily education and uh, pedagogical type of a background and work, working closely with a primarily tech centric organization and team members has been also, you know, a bit of a cultural exchange and knowledge exchange. So we'll be discussing all of these things, hopefully through the conversation that we're having, but it has been an excellent learning journey for us uh, working with Avni. So happy to be here and share this platform. Uh, Siddesh, so uh, Thanks, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you kind of started with uh, with the fact of different organizations working in different, and you coming from an education background, right? So you're right. Like Avni deals with technology, uh, LFE deals with uh, education, and the government it's a different beast completely, right? So there are differences in expectations, working styles, and sometimes there are funders also involved in which which makes another organization you have the un 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 enviable task of actually trying to merge everything put together everything here and actually being like the the one in between trying to connect everything so um what what kind of changes how do you navigate the situation and what kind of changes do you do in your working style communication or what kind of uh, uh, say advice would you give for somebody in your position or what are the things that have worked for you? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Vinay. I think lots of questions bundled into one over here, but we'll we'll take it one by one. One is, of course, uh, how do we even navigate these multiple cultures and working styles, etc., coming together? Uh, the primary thing has been, and this has been the central problem of working in the development sector as well. Uh, I'm wondering whether there's any app uh, spotlight that was happening before this or we are launching into this completely because there was this is the first time this is the very first time oh, okay okay yeah sure so anytime you all do the product features and all of that that's a separate story but here i'm thinking more in terms of uh while working with the governments our approach has always been human centric so whatever relationship exists between other me and arjun and vinay and me and the government officers and our team members who are working together that is a reflection of the kind of work also that we are able to do together. If the relationship becomes strained, uh, then we are not able to create that much value. So A, having that human centric uh, approach to the work definitely helps. So it is, I mean, like you uh, gave this conceptualization of the government as a different beast. We have a more empathetic and humanized version of the government. But yes, working with the government might not be the easiest always, but not everybody in the government is difficult to work with as the stereotype may be there. So maybe not treating the government as a monolith and humanizing 
the various elements within the government and specifically the officials that we are working with is definitely a very important first starting point for us. So whether it is the IT person within the government who is operating within various constraints, resources and infrastructural limits that they have, at the same time, a huge mandate of, you know, running the data and tech infra for the state. So that is understanding their limit limitation and still working with them. Similarly, in within our team, the program team who is working, we are really, for us, the, T, the Avni platform or the TCHAP is a means to an end. It is, we really don't care whether the search bar is on top or on the bottom, or how is it that the data is seen. We, what we are, what we care about is that the teacher should be observed by the mentor. The observation conversation should happen. The score should be very transparently captured. And that is giving us some pedagogical insight onto the teaching learning processes. So it's a, it is a tool, but Avni is also looking at it from the fact that it's a platform for, you know, uh, case-based analysis over time. So it may be useful in water, it may be useful in sanitation, it may be useful in health, many, many other applications and education is just one of the different use cases for you. So this was naturally a very big uh, learning curve for us. What helped with uh, the, whether it is the adoption or whether it is uh, accommodation is that I think uh, one is, there were very clear project deadlines and project definitions that these certain things have to be done because this is a hard deadline set by the government. There is nothing you or I can do about it. And then uh, we also didn't know how to communicate requirements to a tech team. So we had to learn the language of how to specifically tell Vinay and team that this is what we want. And then Vinay had to then internally work with the developers to figure out, okay, if this is what we want, then what are the technical uh, changes that you have to make? So those were really uh, the things that we had to learn. And big thanks goes to our own internal data and m &E team who used to codify what requirements and wish list we had and then communicate to you. Similarly, then whatever constraints you guys would communicate to us that this is a platform, you just because like any other app, you can't do you know basic development or screens the way you want. This is what the platform has. This is what you will have to work with. So then communicating the same to the government that, you know, we are not having our own app. It is not like a standalone thing. We are working with a broader open source platform. That is why we, these are the only things that will work. And these are the only thing that is going to be available at this time. Then government will give us a requirement saying geolocation. We don't trust the uh, people. Then how do we turn that on over here? Then translating that change back to the users is another challenge where users will have to again activate it and give those permissions. Uh, so having a really strong field team uh, with good relationships and WhatsApp groups with all the users also helped us do this. So what I'm trying to say with all of these examples is a accommodation made by the Avni team to uh, basically humor all the deadlines and urgencies with which we used to approach accommodation made by the LFE team to understand what are the constraints of the platform and be realistic with our expectations of what can be done on the field and on the app. And then communicate and not overcommit things to the government in the air without understanding what is possible and what is not. So I think this frequent communication and accommodations on both sides of the table really helped uh, navigate all of these things. Yeah, that's really useful for us to know. So there are essentially two things that I understand. One is uh, to have quite a lot of human to human interaction when it comes to dealing with uh, multiple people. And I guess the second thing is to have a really strong field team who can, who will be able to communicate things to everybody broadcast at the same time and make sure that the engine is moving forward in some sense. Did I capture that right? Absolutely. I think the human centric aspect of it between us and then how a field team has to be uh, oriented very strongly so that they are dealing with the end users and the adoption at the field level. Yeah, for sure. And one thing you did mention about uh, one was when you were talking about the government, when you said uh, you go to them, tell them this is not our own product. It's an open source product and this is how it works and things like that. And mm -hmm. one of the things I also understand is that uh, you also kind of understand why the open source and why the product way, at least at Avni, right? We believe that open source and products are the way to go for building software for the NGO world. Now, the principle is that the grant money is a public fund. It's created by charitable humans across the world. And it has to be 
providing the highest return on investment possible because there is not too much really uh, money that you can put in into the tech space within the NGO sector. And what we believe is that the product and products work best because a significant portion of all the investments that you make are reusable. So when you when you build something, when you ask us to build something, it essentially is built, but it's it, it is reusable and everybody can actually use it. And there is usually some kind of synergy between us, uh, Avni, and the organizations that choose with us. So my question is, uh, it's, it's more of a personal question to you, is what do you think about... Uh, products versus projects and open source versus closed tool. Do you, I mean, I know you don't really care too much as far as it gets the job done is one uh, one philosophy that you keep, but do you also have opinions about products and open source? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely we do. One of the ethos I, in my conversations with both you and Arjun has always come through is the commitment to public goods. And that is something LFE also believes in. We also work with public school systems largely because we don't want a proprietary solution or something that is privately owned to something that is essentially a public service, which is education, right? And that is something which is why we are supporting public systems and government institutions to uh, improve because that is where the heart of the magic or whatever, the kind of service we're trying to provide in the development sector lies. So the ethos level is 100% matching where there is a commitment to public goods and open source. Uh, what what I have also seen is a the the finance layer that you brought into it that it you know it's a charitable fund and deserves to be utilized to the maximum value is definitely an eye-opening statement. Uh, what the my take on this entire thing is that in the non-profit sector, specifically in education, we are a big fan of proprietary solutions. EdTech also has been coming in saying this content, this way of teaching addition is proprietary to me so you have to pay me some subscription so that i can tell you which is the best way to teach addition why why cannot something that is a basic foundation literacy numeracy skill be open source let everybody benefit from it and you okay because i have gotten done the job of creating that content pay me some fee but these kind of paywalls for these kind of basic uh, information is something that i have been principally opposed to uh, in my way of working so it has been very gratifying to work with somebody with similar commitments. In fact, if funders come and tell us, which also happened recently that, you know, you, why are you bothering sticking with this platform? Why not develop your own app? It will be a much cheaper. You will have full control over it. Why do you want to do it? I said, it will not have the use case and the lasting beyond this project. Then what do we do? Whereas this money, if you're using it, this same uh, changes that we're making is going to benefit the platform and actually give you more value on the money that you're spending. So that has actually been helpful in conversation with funders, fully uh, embrace the fact that this has to be done. Whereas the second aspect that is useful is in conversation with governments, where it is much uh, in our case has been somewhat beneficial to uh, convince them that we are using this platform because Say, for example, you made the point about Metabase or maybe something like a superset. It's an open source dashboard versus something like a, a what is that which has uh, you, those, uh, uh, what is the Tableau, right? The Tableau, Tableau has got uh, much more, uh, you know, it's, it looks much more beautiful, but it's got such a significantly high per user cost that it becomes uh, very unsustainable when, when we are operating at the scale of the government. So when we told the government that, hey, we have such a good looking dashboard with so many functionalities, uh, at which is open source, they also got interested as, as to how it is that we are using it and how we are not paying because government had invested a lot of money in Tableau. And they said, oh, you're getting all of these features for open source and it is secure because the uh, myths that many people in the government have is open source means it will not be secure. So the understanding cyber security, data security and encryption protocol versus being something open source versus proprietary was another conversation that it led to. And of course, we are not the technical experts to have this conversation, but we said that as a, this is not the case that, you know, your data or the government data is suddenly going to disappear. There are multiple uh, examples where open source products can be used for public uh, use cases as well. So why not try it out? And, and then they were ready. The learning has also been that as long as there is a security audit, and this is the related to the handover bit of it, as long as there is a strong security audit, which is a learning for Avni as well as LFE, government is okay with sort of taking over open source uh, applications. 
So I think combination of all of these factors are definitely useful. And as an ethos, I completely believe in uh, some in open source transparency. Community can edit, make changes, suggest edits, those kind of things. Yeah. In fact, we are working right now with a bunch of interns as well who uh, through something called the C4 uh, GT Code for Government Tech program where uh, there are students who are coming in and they are kind of contributing. So the Metabase, uh, uh, like the automatic reports on Metabase is actually being worked on by one of the interns today. Uh, and eventually it will get absorbed into the code base and be useful for everybody. So uh, so that yeah, that's something that we're also trying to get in a lot more community involved in our uh, process right now. That's wonderful. Uh, and when you talked about government, so you talked about the security audit and everything, right? So, um, I mean, we've done security and it's been a learning for us as well as to what all things need to be taken care of when you're doing a security audit. And I'm sure there are a hundred other things that you would have to take care to, uh, like try to see how to actually move the, uh, like an app from one place to another, essentially from us to the uh, EMIS vendor who is uh, running the apps for this pro program. So what kind of learnings or what kind of uh, uh, things that, and now that it, it's actually a proper handover to the government in some sense, right? There are a lot of uh, organizations, even within people who are using Avni, who kind of work with the government, but right now they want to act hand over to the government. Uh, what le important learnings or what are, what is the a uh, piece of advice that you would uh, you would want to give them yeah i mean more than advice i can share our experience one is uh, when it uh, similar to when it comes to working with government for anything it is to ensure that there are some set of conducive circumstances that either are in place or we are putting into place it's a combination of availability of financial and human resources capabilities to even run something in the first place I think bureaucrats, IAS officers have the vision for it. They know the utility that it serves, but they don't have often either a department or a support staff to be able to run this kind of a uh, application and manage it on their own. IT departments of state governments usually ma maintain servers, databases, there is uh, and and at a big level stuff. So an app like this one is a one hundredth or one thousandth of the kind of work that they have to do and may not as passionately as this close group of people monitoring and maintaining it, they might just, okay, they, even if they migrate it onto their databases and servers, it, it, they might not take care of it and make those changes the way we might uh, be vigilant about making. So one is definitely having the set of circumstances. What was helpful in this is that it was the project by itself designed for the fact that the government had to onboard it within five years. Second, uh, we were fortunate that in the state such as Andhra Pradesh, there is also a robust IT department, which has got a series of uh, EMIS partners. Earlier, TCS was one of the companies which had supported the department and now they have other uh, companies who are strongly working on a long term contract with the government to maintain not just the educational apps, but also other IT infrastructure and uh, software infrastructure that the government would need. So. Uh, one is pro project mandate, second is having this uh, external partners that the government is working with be in place. So that made the uh, transfer sort of easier where we, we knew that there is only a uh, limited time where an NGO can support. The narrative which we also came to the government with was that end of the day we are an NGO, we can't be expected to pay server costs for every time government uh, employees are you know making entries. So at some point we have to also justify that we are a charitable organization. We have to hand it over. Secondly, working with multiple people, again, not expecting that, okay, Mira kaam ho gaya, I'm handing it over, Tata, bye bye. Having a proper transition plan in place, working and handholding even the EMIS vendors, the government functionaries who are uh, responsible for it. Uh, and the third layer, which sometimes gets overlooked is this, the policy layer. How do we put in place certain government orders and mandates, which will ensure that even once the technical partner uh, is walking away, the internal mechanism is going to look after it, uh, which means that a there has to be a social and educational relevance for that app. Uh, if nobody is utilizing it, then why is the tech team maintaining it? So ensuring that these kind of utilization of the app and some targets are baked in into the job descriptions and annual work plans of the department. So that is one thing we have done. 
secondly ensuring that there is a clear uh, mandate from the head of the department to the emis agency which which has a clear roadmap and a review sort of a cadence that every two months this will be reviewed so you need to get this done so having that policy and documentary mandate in place is, is also helpful so to summarize i think a combination of again working with that human touch having a strong transition plan uh, baking the transition and handover in the mou itself and in the project plan itself availability of partners and then that documentation and policy mandate uh, are these uh, handover uh, handover documents is that something that you had to bring in or is that something that was already present in the capability of the uh, of the andhra government itself in their policies and procedures like no it was not in the sense that uh, where, where we had to ensure that we app has been created but what is the app for app is to ensure that teachers are supported observations are happening mentoring is happening we are able to collect continuous data on the teaching learning practices of the what are happening in the schools so in service of that this app should be maintained the app should be utilized and these are the targets these are the review cadences that need to be put in place this is something that we have co-worked with the government and ensure that they are releasing an order uh, to this effect which will ensure that at least there is some uh, you know at the field level utilization of it so that the tech team also has the pressure in case you know there are some issue resolution that has to happen the, if it has been usually utilized issues will come and if issues will come tech team has to resolve it so it's more of ensuring that there is that some document which mandates this to be done uh, that is and useful one last question but before i say that uh, the floor will be open for i mean it, it's uh, open to everyone to actually ask questions um, i'll just ask this question and i'll go silent next um I, i hope people are able to uh, unmute yourself if not please uh, put on the chat that uh, i mean to to unmute yourself uh the okay so sidesh what what next so you've uh, digitized the teach uh, the who teach completely into one app it's been successfully used in ap and hopefully successfully will be used in nagaland as well where do you plan to take this technology forward yes so like i said begin the technology is also hand in hand with the idea that we are trying to bring in uh, so that is something so i want to again introduce a little bit of the background before we go into the future uh, in india at least in the education sector different people have tried experimenting with classroom observation it is no secret or uh, you know not an unknown fact that classrooms must be observed and teachers unless we are observed we will not be able to support them when i was a teach for india fellow every two months uh, one manager used to come and observe me and on a detailed template give me feedback that this is something i am doing well this is something i am not doing and these are the three ways in which i can improve so by the time they used to visit the next time i used to ensure that i am improving on those three things and prioritizing my energy and uh, self upskilling to that level so if that same type of improvement and culture of continuous learning has to come within teachers in the government sector this process has to be uh, instilled but the sheer scale of you know thousands of uh, tens of thousands of schools lakhs of teachers crores of children how do we make this happen because the classroom is still a black box when we're sitting at the state level looking from a policy perspective what is the actual end level teacher student interaction where the breakdown is happening due to which student learning outcomes are not coming happens to be unknown now what this technology uh, process is helping us do is change the conversation from uh, a thinking that teachers are useless they don't know to do anything they ill treat the students now those kind of myths will be broken because we will have a human observer using technology parallelly doing lakhs and lakhs of observation across the board so last year i think we had more than 1 lakh observation instances just in andhra pradesh alone in nagaland we have got tens of thousands in maharashtra we are going to be uh, having again one entire district adopt this so the idea is that we are uh, so far apps etc have been used for what to assess if mid day meal has gone correctly to assess if toilets are clean to assess if uh, student as attendance is happening or not to monitor teacher attendance but what we are trying to say is through this technology platform and the associated program around it we are saying the dashboard around how many teachers are asking an open ended question to the child how many teachers are treating students respectfully how many teachers are respecting the autonomy of the child 
in the teaching learning process are they using multiple forms of representation while explaining a concept versus just using the blackboard all of this is now captured through this uh, form and we are able to get uh, not only lakhs of instances we are also able to get repeat instances to see if there is any delta in a particular teacher based on any mentoring support that have been given and this data is now part of the you know dashboard at a samagra shiksha at a state level so in addition to attendance and other demographic data we are also able to see teaching learning data and not just assessment data that you know x number of students are scoring uh, y percentage on uh, addition and multiplication and so on so we are able to sort of marry the two data sets together to understand what is happening so this conversation is changing and this idea is really powerful that we we don't just monitor outcomes and we don't just monitor attendance we also monitor teaching and learning and this is giving us a language to do so and this because of this successful implementation and handover in nagaland as well as now in andhra pradesh we are able to use this data and go to newer states and say that these are the two states which have adopted it already a technological architecture and backbone exists for it right it is open source a lot of development cost has already been incurred so we can come to you at a much lower cost we will do this for you in three districts so help us out and we will come to you with you know a solid understanding of where the breakdown is happening and how we can support your teachers so that conversation we have been able to have really well we have got a strong interest from maharashtra now where our our internal teams are using it we are going to go to two or three districts where we are going to have 100% teachers being observed using this uh, technology solution so uh, yeah so that is that is a future plan use the power and transformative stories from these successful case studies and expand to newer geographies hopefully two or three states where we can do the other thing what the world bank is now asking us to do is also handhold other organizations to do this so why should lfe be the only one avni as a platform is open to everyone let us use that app and lfe can build the capacity of other ngo partners to use this classroom observation technique because end of the day the teach tool also is a public good there is no proprietary copyright on the teach tool is creative commons anybody can go to the world bank website download the teach tool use the manual and learn it and implement it in their context so we will be doing that as well and we will be strongly advocating for having this kind of a technology backbone because without it it, it fails imagine 10000 observers doing pen and paper how do we aggregate the data and so on so all of this is uh, as an integrated solution something that we are looking to make a strong impact in the sector and also partner with more and more government bodies to implement it that was very inspirational i have more questions but i'll stop right now for uh, for others because we have only 9 minutes left yeah uh, hi vinay uh, himesh here am i audible yes okay so i had one question for sidesh um, so what are the technological tools have you uh, utilized as part of your uh, lfe organization apart from abni right uh, thanks himesh for your question we are uh, we use basically we have a very robust uh, data and monitoring team so what we are doing is we use survey cto for uh, form based data collection across the board we have stopped using google forms due to some of the limitations that the tech team reported so survey cto is one thing we are using uh, an open another moodle based lms platform for our online courses and so on and we are trying to develop an api to ensure that we are getting direct data from it Uh, we use of course zoom and other uh, online conferencing platforms for webinars and online training sessions uh, we use uh, extensively we are using your erp systems internally for performance management attendance mapping uh, reporting uh, task management that kind of a thing we use slack for internal communication and minimizing uh, what do you call it uh, and minimizing our internal emails we are also using the superset dashboard uh for which is again uh, combined with avni to co communicate large scale sort of data based insights we use data wrapper for presenting you know uh, visual data visualizations for our reports so multiple type of a thing we also have partnered with glyphic for experimenting on a chatbot to increase our user engagement so technology uh, and data using using that to influence our program design and actually program design influencing the way data is or the tech solution looks like which is how we have worked with avni where our program also influence some 
parts of Avni. That is something we are strongly believe in in LFE, and these are the various products and tech solutions we are trying to use. Um, yeah. Okay. So just a follow up question on that. Uh, yeah. So you said you use Moodle based uh, learning video platform. Um, so this I have not uh, used Moodle or seen it before. So is this more to provide learning videos of a specific topic or what is the purpose of it? Yeah. So it's a learning management system. Basically, we have launched courses for teachers and government officers. So how do we ensure that the learners are logging in completing their specific modules and courses, checking their progress, time spent online, capturing their pre-test posters details, those kind of a thing. It's, a, it's like an entire end-to-end -end learning platform, uh, similar to a Coursera or an edX. Uh, yeah. we, are, we are using some platform to do that. We have partnered with this organization called Firki. It is maintained by Teach for India. And they are helping us maintain, I mean, it's their platform. We are just utilizing it for the courses and rolling out our courses. So. That's okay. been a good so, sort of experience for us. Okay, so this is mostly for teachers and officers. You said not for the children. Not for the children. Not for the children. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this I have a question. Uh, yeah. So uh, as I'm not much aware about uh, how the transition take place uh, from the NGO to the government and what sort of role government has after uh, the transition has happened. Uh, but I just wanted to understand, uh, let's say, for uh, the Andhra Pradesh project where government has intervened now and the project is sort of handed over to the government, uh, what sort of intervention uh, LFE as an in, as a NGO uh, takes or what role LFE has after the government has intervened uh, to, to track the progress of the project and everything? All right. No, that's a great question. Uh, I'll clarify. One is that it is, it is not that the project overall has been handed over, the tech, the app has been handed over to government. So earlier we were hosting it on our, uh, we were paying for AWS and we were hosting it and taking care of the things with Avni's support. Avni was obviously the tech partner maintaining it. But right now the entire app has been handed over and is being hosted on government servers by the government uh, internal vendors, right? So that is one change. The role that LFE had to do was we had to maintain detailed documentation, we had to enable the smooth transition, uh, we had to get uh, some sort of a empaneled agency to do a security audit and assure the government that if they onboard this, they will be secure and so on. And ensure that whatever the uh, the agency, so the security audit agency mentioned, those risks, etc. have been neutralized. So those things, coordination we did. Now having transferred it to the government, we still have two more years as part of the project to implement it. It is just that we are not running the app and we are not taking the headache of issue resolution. We are not taking the headache of logins and you know all of those things which we had we had to do. The government is doing all of that. We are focusing more on okay, the app is there. How do we utilize it? Uh, how do we ensure that the app is the observations are happening? So we have moved more to a field based and program based uh, role right now rather than worry more about the technology part of things. Uh, we have trained around 15,000 observers, certified observers in the state who would be utilizing this app and each person will be observing around 20 to 25 teachers. So that's a huge number of teacher observations that we would be doing and making sense of that, giving insight to the government, supporting the teachers, creating videos and programs for the teachers, that is going to be our role more and helping the field observers conduct and utilize this app. Uh, at a at a ground level, so that is more of our role right now, which is more programmatic in nature. Thanks, thanks, Sudesh. Yeah, hi, Sudesh. Uh, thanks for first of all, uh, like uh, graciously accepting the invite to join uh, uh, for this call uh, in a short notice. I think this was. Uh, a uh, lot of interesting information that I think uh, uh, that got out of this and your perspective on them. Uh, one thing I think when we initially started with the project, uh, we started out uh, with uh, a lot of features, a uh, lot of things we've done also uh, successfully, like for example, security audit, UI, UX improvements and uh, like certain other features in the app. We had tried out with timer feature. I think that uh, probably didn't work out well. We set out, I think, the original uh, 
conversation started with a chatbot uh, use case uh, i was curious about the chatbot uh, this thing even though i mean we we built the avniglyphic integration part of it i think that's probably ready for maybe the next project i think here based on the uh, i think the new agency's preferences i i was curious to know whether that itself is happening if you can uh, elaborate a bit on like what the use case was for the audience and then i'm interested to know what the status is currently is that happening not happening definitely i think the use case was fantastic when we had brainstormed on this uh, we, a we have over delivered on what the mandate was what the world bank had asked us to do was take the pen and paper tool which is a list of 29 checklist type of a thing, make an app, which is a form based data collection thing, which will digitize it, right? That was a basic mandate given to us. But we, uh, of course, spoke to you, we uh, Lobo uh, for tech for dev, he guided us. And we realized that what the problem is really, how do we change user behavior, user behavior, meaning how can teachers te change their teaching learning practices? How can observers gain a clear uh, transparent standardized insight on the quality of teaching learning practices and then how can change be okay now i know that i'm at a level two how do i go to a level three some input should be given to me so how do we also democratize and make the process so transparent so it is not that only i as an observer have access to your teaching scores everything is automated so rather than build a communication feature into avni or into any form based data collection app or a chat feature we decided that WhatsApp, where everybody already is, should be the choice of communication. Form-based data collection should be happening on Avni. Data should be represented and stored on Metabase, Superset, whatever it is. So this three-part system basically works in consonance so that data is collected, data is represented, data is reported and communicated to the stakeholders. So this was the overall solution, three-part solution, which a was much lower cost in developing such an integrated solution from scratch and uh, works well open source solution except for the whatsapp subscription piece of it uh, so the use case was that a teacher would be observed uh, after the observation image a before the observation the fact when you click schedule on avni a notification goes through whatsapp that so and so observer has scheduled an observation they will come to your school so it's not like a subscribe inspection we wanted to create the uh, behavior and uh, thing that it is okay you're going to be observed this is a natural process somebody is coming to support you then after the observation based on the scores given by the observer the either the whole report card or top three behaviors bottom three behaviors would go via whatsapp to the teacher based on the bottom three behaviors uh, we would have created some uh, learning videos. So say, for example, I am not asking open-ended questions. I'm only asking very basic factual questions. So how to ask open-ended question is already a five minute video that I would have created. And if that is a low performing behavior for me as a teacher, I would automatically receive that video saying that these are the top bottom three performing for you. It is not just you. Many other teachers are struggling with this. So please look at this video. Maybe next time you will be able to integrate some of this. So keeping the communication very non-threatening, very non-judgmental and still motivating teachers to learn, that is the use case. So automatic report comes in, automatic learning content also comes in through the chatbot. And I think that is the glyphic uh, use case that Avni had already built out. But by the time we could, because it was not part of the original mandate, even though it was approved by the previous officer, the newer officer are like, this is more subscription and I don't want to do. And they had already entered into a agreement with another tech vendor for a chatbot. So they said, why not marry that chatbot to this solution? If chatbot is all you want, why do you want to give me your own chatbot? I said, okay, it's fine. If that is what the state wants, we'll have to play by that. And that is what has been done right now. I am informed by my team members that the, that solution is finally ready after one year of uh, downtime. And maybe this August onwards, it will be deployed uh, where we'll test out this automated reporting and video sending. We will test it. We have done some testing of it. It seems stable at the moment, but we have not done live rollout at the field. So uh, August onwards, we'll be rolling it out and I'm curious to see how that will unfold. But in other jurisdictions, we want this as an integrated solution to exist. Great, thanks. I think that's that's still fantastic to hear that it's uh, uh, like rolled out or or ready to roll out. Uh, would definitely. Again, that's a proprietary thing. 
it is built by a company on a proprietary platform which will obviously uh, have a front end of whatsapp but it is not as uh, maybe equitably built or the way the ethos with which avni would do it but again there's a this is a state's call not my call on how that should play out so uh, we are going with uh, what we have the cards on the table we are playing with that yeah not so much i mean solution fine i mean this is a different uh, solution that's being put there uh, in terms of different products but still the use case is being operationalized so i would be keen i mean we would definitely touch base on that definitely. how the how the use case is playing out compared to like the idea versus actualization so how is playing out how it is playing out in reality that would be of interest uh, maybe i'm also curious and i'll be documenting that hopefully we'll write about it Sure. but uh, it's it's very it's going to be fascinating because at an idea level is beautiful sab kuch automatic ho raha hai learning is happening magic but we'll see what right. challenges we run into thanks uh, so a, a very very uh, similar question and we are actually out four minutes over but uh, i i did want to ask you one question so similar to how you said you'll be writing about it right so i was wondering if uh, like there are some outcomes from a from a technology intervention perspective some kind of a, a like a study or metrics or something that you plan to take out of uh, the ap implementation by any chance yes definitely so one of the things that has happened is that uh, one advantage of the way this entire salt project uh, has been structured is that there is another uh, implementation partner called education initiatives and they run the student assessments so they have reported some some gain in the student scores as well so the exercise that we will be doing is mapping uh, and seeing if there is any correlation between gains seen from the teach tool gains seen from the teacher development courses and gains seen in the student learning and and trying to see if there there is any correl like significant correlation over there based on that then we'll pro probably you know write a successful case study that a combination of all of these factors has potentially obviously there is no uh, one there can't be any attribution effect but we can say there is some contribution towards the broader change that we are trying to see and here are things that we did so if anybody wants to learn from it one can learn from it so that is the tone that we will be taking so it will take time for all of this data to come in the correlation studies etc to be done but that is the intent that we have yeah at that at the end at least if the outcomes are good then, then yes. we've made an impact so we there will be multiple more rounds of uh, our own observations plus teacher courses plus student assessments so maybe by december 2026 we would have a much more uh, uh, valuable lesson to be learned another thing i don't i i i'm glad to see 20 people are still around what i wanted to say was uh, jpal is also going to be studying one part of this uh, intervention in three districts in andhra pradesh uh, where again the teach tool intervention with the avni app being used uh, in three schools we have come up with an rct design where there will be only observations observation plus chatbot and learning and coaching and mentoring and control with no observations or nothing happening these two treatment treatment plus and control these kind of three group type of a intervention we have uh, designed sampling has been completed and now august onwards that is going to be kicking in the government has given permissions for it and uh, they have also secured grant for it so i'm very very eager to see over the next 18 months how this study progresses and uh, this is also an answer to what next what next is the study of how well this intervention works and see what we can learn from it to see what you know can be contributed to the sector at large so very very eager to participate in that study and learn from it thanks a lot um does anyone else have questions to ask this in fact i have a question for, for you guys how was your experience in working with an organization such as ours you had very specific demands sometimes unreasonable deadlines it may have seemed very unreasonable to you when we came that you know in 24 hours or 48 hours government has asked please build us out for us so i know we have had a lot of back and forth discussions and you all have tried up your best to accommodate us how was that experience for you from your development cycle standpoint 
So I can say only from my perspective, uh, others, uh, other perspectives can be different also. So uh, a lot of times, yes, the timelines have been very aggressive and uh, and unreasonable as well in, a, in, in many scenarios because like there a lot of times it was just not possible and we eventually like it came out true that it actually didn't happen in in many many of these cases and what we could do is just warn that warn you that this is probably not going to happen so you better prep the uh like uh, prep everyone else that this is probably not going to happen even though you say that it's uh, it's going to happen so that that's one thing uh, i think from a communication perspective things have worked out very well and uh, I mean, uh, a lot of times, right? So when you have like a list of 10 items and usually what happens is you need to start prioritizing the first two, the, the first three and actually push that through. And that kind of a conversation was really easy to have with you, with, uh, with you or anybody at LFE. It was actually easy to get that uh, prioritization conversation going wherever required. And whenever there is there are delays, it's been uh, like... We've mostly been just transparent at saying what this is what is really happening. And uh, that has kind of worked out, at least uh, from a from a delivery perspective, it has kind of worked out very well. Uh, so that's been, and I, I've seen at least in most cases that you've been mostly reasonable when it comes to asking for things. And when you, when we say that it's really not possible, then you understand it's not possible and it's not like we're hiding something behind the scenes and saying that it's not possible. So that kind of a trust kind of uh, worked out very well is what, uh, at least what I feel. Got it. And things like you are, you all were, I don't think UI UX was very big on your list of things to do, but it got bumped up the list because an opportunity came along. That's so true. it was very nice of you all to make that accommodation. But again, was that like a learning experience or is that now something that you are going to use extensively in the future what is the thought process behind it? so it's in there and right now we've not gotten enough feedback yet i mean we did a presentation i think last month where uh, uh, people were excited uh, the rollout and actual adoption has not completely happened yet so this is like it's it's mostly like the feature is there but i need to actually switch it on for my implementation to use it that's how it usually works and uh, uh, we we need to see this over the next three to four months I think it will be useful, but at the same time, I there is no data point to prove either ways at this point. We have to get more feedback from the other users and other yes. people. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much. Sure. But Tadesh, I would add that definitely dashboard is looking much more uh, beautiful. So I think thanks to LFE's effort uh, towards uh, pushing us, it was on our list uh, for quite some time to do it. And I think the uh, the the project and funding opportunity that you brought i think that helped us to pick it up and get it done so that has definitely i think helped feedback of course from the actual users once they start using it i think we'll get to know great thanks Arshu. hey then thanks a lot for your time siddesh i know it's been short notice and uh, we actually extended your time as well <laughs> Uh, during this call, but this was a very, very informative. Very happy to be here. Happy to be part of the conversation. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, actually, we would be sharing this uh, recording with all the participants. Uh, if at all any questions people wanted to ask but couldn't ask because of the time constraint, then uh, you can mail us the queries and yeah, we can get it answered. And uh, going forward, at least uh, starting next month, we will have like a scheduled uh, kind of a, a thing where everyone will actually have what happened past month and actually have, we'll invite at least one NGO during this time frame and uh, see uh, how to, uh, um, like how to take this forward. And most probably there will be one, at least one spotlight, like what we had this year. Uh, hopefully, uh, I don't know how if we can get get this uh, discussion better the next time or not, but uh, we'll try our best. Uh, we, this time we actually had quite a few people uh, from uh, from existing implementations as well who kind of left out. Uh, many of them have actually left at this time, but uh, uh, to everyone, thanks a lot for staying in, listening, and uh, if you have any questions, if you want to reach out to us, you can always. Uh, uh, contact us at hello at foundation.org or uh, go to avniproject.org and uh, 
like fill out one of those uh, contact forms. Uh, once again, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, see you. Bye.